George Washington Carver once said, an education is the key to unlock the golden door to freedom. However, in America, one of the freest nations in the world, about half of our students aren't being given a functioning key. Now, you may be asking yourself, what on earth is he talking about? Everyone has the opportunity to an equal education in America, right? Unfortunately, wrong. All across our nation currently, young girls are being disenfranchised and discriminated against by sexist policies, and I believe it's time that somebody take a stand. So today I'd like to talk to you about two sexist policies in our schools and whose job it is to finally stand up and say that enough is enough. So first, let's talk about one policy that each and every one of you in this room has dealt with. And off the top of your head, you might not think it's sexist, but dress codes in schools can be, and most likely are, sexist. From Rory Carroll from The Guardian on September 24th of this year, he talks about how the current round of dress codes is targeting girls. It's centered around girls who show too much skin or wear yoga pants or leggings. And whenever they violate these dress codes, they're either sent home or forced to wear baggy shame suits. He talks about one girl in an American high school who was forced to wear red sweatpants and a neon yellow shirt that said dress code violator because her mom couldn't take off of her 12-hour shift to bring her a change of clothes, and the school didn't trust her to go home, change, and come back. Now, you might be thinking, that, that's just an isolated incident, right, Connor? You're blowing that out of proportion. I wish that were true. Because according to the Associated Press, on September 15th of this year, in fact, most dress code violations are dealt towards girls. Their article talked about a New York high school where over a two-week time span, 200 detentions were given for dress code violations. 90% of those dress code violations were females. Their article goes on to talk about a Florida high school where around the same time frame, around the same number of detentions was given, and 80% of those violators were females. The article talks about how we see this troubling majority all across our nation's public high schools where females are being sent home or punished for dress code violations at a much more alarming rate than any males. Think back to your dress codes. On paper, they might not seem very sexist, but upon their implementation, they most likely are. If you don't remember the exact wording of your dress codes, I read to you from Republic District's dress code, updated August 1st of this year. Any form of extremism of dress, clothing that is too tight, too revealing, or shorts or skirts that are too short will be dealt with on an individual basis. Shorts or skirts should reach mid-thigh in length. Even though it really only talks about females' clothing, that's not too sexist, right? Well, upon implementation, unfortunately it is. I take you back to a day in my junior year of high school where I was wearing shorts that were probably too short for any human being to wear. They didn't even reach my mid-palm. When I walked into college algebra, I got a thumbs up from my teacher. She said, Congrats on showing that much skin, Connor. However, when a female student walked in five minutes later, she was sent to the office and later sent home that day for a dress code violation. Her dress was longer than my shorts. So men who violate dress codes are given a thumbs up, whereas girls are sent home. But an even more troubling policy is something that's just now being implemented, and that's the segregation of classes based on gender. We most likely all dealt with this in PE or health class, and that might have made a little bit of sense. <laughs> Boys and girls have different bodies, so they need to learn about their bodies separately. But when in a PE class, you separate classes by gender because boys are stronger and girls are weak, you're teaching gender stereotypes and enforcing gender bias, and that's troubling. But what's even more troubling is the fact that it's not just in the gym anymore. Gender bias and gender stereotyping is moving into our classrooms, in math and English classrooms, all across the United States, where we're splitting them based on gender because boys are typically better at math and girls are typically better at English. That's detrimental to both sexes. But first, I'd like to talk about the detriment to females. From Amy Novotny from the American Psychological Association on February 11th of 2011, she talks about how girls' classrooms aren't given the same quality resources that boys are. In boys' classrooms, 
competition and aggressiveness are rewarded, whereas in girls' classrooms, passivity is rewarded. Michael Kimmel from CNN on February 3rd of this year extrapolates on that when he talks about an English classroom where boys read Where the Red Fern Grows and girls read The Witch of Blackbird Pond. Now, the English teacher that enacted that policy said it only made sense because boys like cotton and dogs and girls like love stories. But what about the girls that like hunting and dogs? Are they thrown out because they would rather read a book with a plot? <laughs> what about the boys who don't like hunting and dogs but would rather read something that doesn't make them cry, read something about two people falling in love? And that's another thing I'd like to talk about. Boys in single gender classrooms are taught that anything that's not manly isn't okay. Allie Bohm from the ACLU on September 10th of 2013 talks about how single gender classrooms flatten differences among boys. Those who don't fit the manly stereotype, the artistic ones, the quiet ones, the musical ones, or the ones who don't like sports are bullied. Now, bullying is always going to happen. And when you're bullied, you're going to get upset. But when a girl's bullied, she's told to cry about it. It's okay to feel sad, talk about your feelings. When boys are bullied, they're told to get over it, to grow up, to solve it with violence. Because crying is girly. Liking love stories is gay. And because of this, we see violence is the way that men often deal with their feelings. One unnamed California teacher in the year 2000 when talking about single gender classrooms, said that boys, instead of crying tears, often cry bullets. Think to every school shooting that you can remember in your brain. Is there ever a female shooter? You probably can't remember one. That's because girls are taught it's okay to feel, it's okay to talk, whereas boys are taught grow up and solve it yourself. And unfortunately, they're solving it with violence. So, if single-gender classrooms are so detrimental to both sexes, why do any schools have them? It's a great question. And when you ask schools that, they say, well, it decreases distraction in the classroom. However, that's also untrue. Sarah Goodkind and Lisa Shelby from the Children and Youth Services Review on August of last year cite a couple of high school students, a boy, who talked about how it actually made the problem worse because he had to skip class to hang out with his girlfriend. He said if his girlfriend was right next to him, he could do his homework and not have to worry about who she was talking to or what she was doing. Girls said much the same thing. They said if their male friend didn't have any classes with them, they would skip class, resulting in detention. Then they aren't even in school to learn, and that's a bigger distraction than someone of the opposite gender sitting right next to you. So something has to be done, but whose job is it? It's everyone in this room's job. I challenge each and every one of you as citizens of Missouri, a state that's often seen as a time capsule into colonial times. Missouri, who's known for our archaic beliefs, to step up and spearhead the revolution to end sexism in schools. Grace Chen from the Public School Review in November, on November 12th of this year talks about why it's Missouri's problem. Because Adrian R3, a school district right within our state borders, was recently sued by the ACLU for their single gender classrooms. So it's happening here. We need to stand up and stop this. Because according to Amanda Datnow, Tracy Hubbard, and Elizabeth Woody from the Ford Foundation, in May of 2001, they released a 77 page brief on all of the problems with single gender classrooms. And I challenge you all to go and read. Google it, the Ford Foundation, and read why all of the single gender classrooms don't work, and then do something about it. Get them out of Missouri, get them out of America. Because, it's like Abraham Lincoln once said, the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of the government in the next. If we allow sexism in our schools today, we're allowing sexism in our government tomorrow. Once we stop teaching Coco Chanel's view, that a woman who doesn't wear perfume has no future, alongside Henry David Thoreau's that men are born to succeed, not to fail, maybe then we will truly be giving everyone that education, that key to 
pop off their golden door to freedom. Maybe then we can actually claim that everyone in America has the equal opportunity to a positive education. Thank you.